Hi, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Kellington T-Touch practitioner for animals and people. This is Tristan. He's a corgi, and he's wearing yet another one of my hairband things from when I used to hula hoop. And it's quite a bright purple, and it's got lovely flowers on it. He says, oh yes, it's very manly. So, we're continuing our series of um, talks about end of life and hospice issues and we're looking at different modalities um, to aid that process and today we're going to talk a little bit about craniosacral therapy which is something that i'm a specialist in and developed a course for small animals and horses and um, if people are interested they can contact me um, a bunch of different ways on facebook facebook messenger or at my um, website sallymorganpt.com and find out more about craniosacral therapy and what it would require for you to offer a class in your area depending on how far you are um, you know you need six people ten people um, like that to start a class for dogs um, and with horses sometimes we have to pay the venue so it's a little more pricey and need more people to attend anyway this work has been a part of my life since 1990 and it is a profound and amazing healing modality um, that I have been using all of these years. And I got my initial training in uh, upledger craniosacral therapy. I worked with Dr. John personally many times and um, have been really uh, privileged to participate in this work. And certainly with animals, um, I developed a, the work with small animals uh, pretty much on my own. And there were two or three other people doing the horse work um, in different places all at the same time. And so I can't claim to have authored that completely on my own, but my, my class is unique as is the classes offered by the other two or three people that teach this work nationwide. So anyway, at end of life, what does craniosacral therapy have to offer? Craniosacral therapy at its core is working with the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord and the tissues that surround the brain and the um, vertebrae and bones in the skull that are part of that system. And generally you're smoothing out um, disruptions in that system with this kind of work. And like T-Touch, it again works on the central nervous system not the muscular system although that system can be affected because you're working on the nerves that control the muscular system so craniosacral therapy is super common now you can probably find someone in your town offering craniosacral therapy work for humans and it's i'm trying to round up some interest <laughs> thanks angel and uh, you can um, probably get a treatment for yourself which will help you understand how it could affect your animal the people that do this work with animals are few and far between. Um, I have had people call me from Utah, Alaska, England, Germany, Holland, Texas, asking for um, help from a person who works on people to work with an animal in great distress. So um, it's just not that popular. Um, and there are people, there's a person offering an online class, but of course there's no hands-on work with that. So. Um, I would not trust it and I don't know <laughs> you know how how skilled the people are that come out of that class anyway so with end-of-life issues we're still looking at the big topics which are pain and stress and fear and of course craniosacral therapy like every kind of modality out there at its core can address those issues um, you can put your hands on basically where the chakras would be there are things called diaphragms in the body um, and that not just the diaphragm muscle, but there are places where the fascia, which is this uh, tissue that runs throughout the body, it conducts electricity uh, faster than even nervous tissue. Fascia is an incredible thing and it's all over the body. Everything in the body is surrounded, protected and supported by fascia. So there are places where the fascia meets vertically and horizontally and you get these cross fibers like this. And it's very dense there so if you have an injury and the fascia gets deformed and it starts to look like this it can stay there causing a disruption through the whole body because it's like having a uh, a twist in your pantyhose which people don't wear anymore but leggings you can imagine when you have a hole in your leggings how your calf just doesn't feel right so cradial like myofascial work um, can allow those tissues to unfold and come back to their normal cross pattern so 
so fascia is not good to break then no you don't want to break your fascia but fascia is very repairable like so many things in the body so in cranial work there are the diaphragms of the body which roughly correspond to where some of the chakras are so it's going to be where that fascia has that interchange and of course there's more energy in those areas so it makes sense that that also corresponds to a lot of things in acupuncture and in fascial work and in reiki and chakra work so you've got one of those junctions here at the lower end the sacral diaphragm you've got the respiratory diaphragm which is over the heart and it covers a lot diagonally of the body this way you've got the thoracic inlet further up here which on a human is the collarbones not all animals have collarbones but it's around this area you've got the cranial the hyoid um, diaphragm which is up here underneath your jaw if you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and tap you can feel the hyoid bone coming out and then of course you have the occipital cranial base which is so interesting it's AO in veterinary work and it's OA in human work but it's the place where your neck meets your head basically and that's another area where you've got strength from this fibers going like this so <clears throat> certainly over the lifetime of an animal those areas can develop lots of those smashed up fibers like gum in your hair and working in those areas at the end of life can really kind of bring some peace and um, release tension in the body can release pain and can really help an animal just sort of settle in a different way um, be more relaxed um, like with my dogs with DM um, you know they can't feel their bodies but they have to be repositioned frequently and you know how it is when you get up and you're a little stiff and you have to straighten your leg for a little while the same thing happens to those animals that are not moving much so working over those diaphragms can really bring some relief and less pressure in the body and uh, really make an animal more comfortable during that hospice process dm angel is degenerative myelopathy it's like human lou gehrig's or als and it's something common in corgis German Shepherds, Boxers, and a few other breeds, and it's paralysis from the back end to the front end, gradually with usually full cognitive function. And so with a human to not be able to move your body, but for your brain to be working 100% is, of course, quite an issue. And with animals, same thing. I mean, these dogs can't walk, and we have carts for them, and um, it's a really debilitating and horrible thing, and it takes a few years um, and you end up being such a full-time caregiver to your dog your connection becomes very deep with a dog with DM um, And it's the same as dogs with many other, you know, life-threatening diseases because you become so um, uh, Tuned in with them with their care like my mom right now is taking care of my sister's dog Charlie Who's like 19 years old cavalier can hardly stand up. He's just so um, weak in his legs and uh, he has special pads on his feet and stuff to help him stand up but sometimes when he pees he can't get out of the way or he starts sliding uh, on the hardwood floor and he gets pee all over him and so my mom's been giving the guy a bath like twice a day um, for a week now <laughs> and when you're doing that with a dog you know they don't like it you don't like it you develop this kind of rapport with them so it can be from any number of things that you're getting this relationship with your dog um, through that end-of-life process, but doing these diaphragm releases can really relieve some of that tension in their body and like Charlie uh, The Cavalier my sister has he's constantly doing side splits Which is not a natural movement for a dog and so being able to do some cranial work and relieve some of that tension in that end of him <laughs> uh, and in his shoulders from trying to pull him up through those situations can really help um, relieve some of that stress when they are getting near the end of their life a what about the mail what i can't really read it april i'm too far away so um so working with cranial work during the end of life can be really beneficial with just the diaphragm releases and then certainly in cranial work we work with the meridians we work with the chakras and an advanced practitioner who is familiar with this kind of work can um, also do some of the same kinds of things that your acupuncturist or your Reiki practitioner would be doing um, and there are also um, we can do what we call a diaphragm release over any joint in the body so I had this horse I was working with who had a lot of uh, fusion in his knee bones and his knee kind of was like permanently bent 
And then, of course, he was down for a week while he was in hospice, and he really couldn't straighten that leg. So um, being able to just hold that knee and allow the tissues to unwind a little bit so that he could have the maximum motion available to him back to make him a little more comfortable when he was lying on the ground. Um, so you can use diaphragm releases over the joints, which can be really helpful for a lot of animals. Um, certainly when you've got a little small dog like a chihuahua, your two hands can cover an entire leg. And so just holding the legs in your hands and allowing that process of tissue unwinding can be a great relief to an animal in that process. What about what? <laughs> I can't read it, April, I'm too far away. Or Angel, I'm too blind. Had a late la night last night. So doing um, cranial work at the end of life can be really beneficial. It's also, in some of its um, particular ramifications, cranial work is much more spiritual um, than some other kinds of work. And so that spiritual connection can also be helpful to the person owning the animal and also with the animal in that process because you really are just witnessing the process of whatever that person or animal is going through that you're working with. So being a witness can really help people and animals when they're dying. Um, the great story that I have on my website is that story of Comet working with the veteran and uh, Comet seemed to be the only one that this guy Dick had ever told his life story to and he had severe post-traumatic stress which was not diagnosed because it wasn't invented yet really after World War II and they just thought he was nuts and put him in you know a hospital for most of his life and he was kind of dangerous but of course you know he was having nightmares and uh, all kinds of emotions and he was able um, during cranial work when I was just working on him a little bit um, but holding Comet on his lap, he was able to tell Comet his life story. And he passed away, you know, like within 24 hours of our session. And so cranial work can do that as well because you are allowing somebody to, um, you're witnessing someone's unresolved issues, find a way to resolution and complete their life process. And that's true for animals, every kind of animal. So often after a cranial session, when an animal is near the end of his life, um, they'll go home and run around the house for like a day and act like they're eight years old again. And then the next day after that, they quiet down and just kind of peacefully slip away. And people are often puzzled. They're like, he got so much better. What happened? But they were grateful for that because it reminds them of the vibrancy and the life of that animal used to have. And the animal's sort of like, oh yeah, I want you to remember me like this, like the way I used to play and run and bark and you know, climb the cat tree with you. And then they are able to just kind of quietly go inward and cross the rainbow bridge. So cranial work can be really important for that aspect of end of life issues for just allowing that completion of process to have that connection with you, that reminder of, you know, what youth was like, and then to quietly um, fold inward and make that transition. So cranial work can be really profound for end of life issues. Um, and it really is a shame there are not many people doing this work um, for end of life with people and animals. Um, I've heard reports from many cranial practitioners working with humans, um, and I've experienced this myself, of sitting with someone when they cross and being able to monitor what we call the cranial rhythm, which is that motion from the head down to the sacrum and back again within the fluid in the spinal cord. And that rhythm continues for quite a long time after someone has died. And it really is the life force. There's a lot of thought in the old writings um, that this is really our, our energy, our prana, our chi, whatever it is, our life force is in that spinal cord. And in some kinds of cranial therapy, um, there's an idea of what they call a long tide. And there is the possibility, which no one can, has proved or looked at yet, that that long tide is the last sort of respiration in your body before your body is no longer. And that can persist for even up to days after you have really experienced what you think is death, when the brain and the heart are no longer seeming to work. So 
this this can be a profound part of helping um, someone across the rainbow bridge monitoring the cranial rhythm and being with them and of course it's almost like when someone's just crossed it's almost like being with someone in a coma because you know they're hearing you and you know you have to anticipate what their answers or questions might be so that you can dialogue with them um, and the presence and uh, neutrality of cranial work can really allow that process to unfold and I've been with people um, who were loved ones of someone who just passed and I have been able to monitor the cranial rhythm of that past person and witness people talking you know saying oh you know father we loved you so much and you know it's okay the grandchildren will be fine and feel the, the rhythm as that is um, just quietly open to what the people are saying um, and usually people are uh, just consoling the person and reminding them that they will be okay and that they've had a good life and that all is forgiven and um, there's a lot of peace in that and people are really hearing it <clears throat> Danny I can't read I'm having a hard time reading what you guys are writing today there's like a glare from the window sorry about that so being in that process um, with cranial work and the presence that it gives to the session can be really beneficial for end of life issues even and you don't need an hour long therapy session you know sometimes just 15 minutes can make a big difference um, and allow uh, whatever needs to happen to happen and it makes a huge difference um, at the end of life and it is a profound type of therapy and like I said it may be the last part of our life as we leave this um, plane on the earth here to wherever we transition to and so having someone experienced with cranial work can be super beneficial um, so that is what I have to say about cranial work and end-of-life issues um, there's lots more information about this in my brain and that we discuss on the last day of my class um, my cranial one class because you know one of the things with animals is that they don't live that long compared to how long we usually live and it's if you're working with animals if you love animals if you have animals knowing how to find support and process their crossing can make a huge difference in your life and the life of people that you know around you and so it's really important I think to include some of these end-of-life issues um, in that class because no one that ever comes to a class will not experience um, the loss of a pet or the loss of someone else's pet who they love um, or even an animal um, like a squirrel that you find in the road so you can do cranial work with your hands on the body or off of the body as well just so people realize that so if you do find a squirrel you can just work from the car um, and even people like me and a few of my uh, colleagues Tracy Broom um, who works primarily with horses out of Colorado um, both of us do long distance cranial work um, and it's really amazing how effective it is when someone calls and says you know a horse that I know and see frequently um, has an issue going on and they're out of town at a show can I offer him some work that night and see what happens and getting the reports back from the people is so interesting so not fair their short lifespan <laughs> yeah this is why we treat them like royalty it's true and you know what's amazing to me there's this book Puck is Promise my sister doesn't like it because it's not written by a vet but the guy's a researcher for National Geographic he's a brilliant writer um, Ted Karasotes his name he has a website and Facebook page and all that and you know he wrote a book about he was so dis disappointed and distressed and upset when his dog died and he was like why is this why can't they live longer and so he talked to people at pet food companies he talked to the vets he asked about rabies he researched all this stuff and he wrote this book about why dogs don't live that long there are many many health reasons why dogs don't live that long um, beyond just our toxic environment <laughs> your living room is no longer yours yeah I have a lady with Pyrenees who doesn't have a sofa for herself anymore all the Pyrenees claim the sofas and you can't move one of them so that's it the sofas are their dog beds um, so Ted's book uh, started this whole conversation for a lot of people about how can your dog live longer and you know just feeding better food which is not a simple thing can really help them live a lot longer and you know my sister's got these rescued cavaliers that were in dire bad health when she got them and feeding them a raw diet 
has really like extended their lifespan. They're 10 years older than 90% of the other Cavaliers and they are not like healthy dogs really. They all have cardiac issues. A lot of them have um, a problem in their spinal cord that's pretty deadly for, <laughs> and yet they just keep going. And I really believe, and my mom's schnauzers, I mean, she hasn't had one live this long before and they're prone to um, a kind of cancer because of their gray color and this dog's been doing fine. So I think the better food is a first start in having your dogs live a lot longer. And I can't emphasize that enough. And for your cats, um, I think that we overlook it, you know, because we are so uh, taken by the pet food companies that, you know, this food's good. It costs $50 a bag. Of course, my dog will do great on it. And yeah, it might be better than your supermarket brand, but it's still not as good as feeding whole food, raw food, lightly cooked food, you know, feeding what's appropriate to your dog in terms of Chinese medicine. I've just talked to someone last night who has um, Weimaramers and they're a hot dog and the dog is exhibiting severe separation anxiety and other kind of nervous issues and other physical problems. The person kept saying, what I'm going to tell you next will surprise you, but no, it fit the whole picture of a dog in heat crisis. <laughs> and I was like, so what are you feeding? Chicken. And I was like, you need to feed cold food, cold water fish. You need to get some duck, some rabbit, some beef even. And we have a great resource for beef around here. So those kinds of changes can really help your dog live a long time. I mean, 20 years is still a drop in the bucket to what we would love them to be here for. Um, but it's better than 10 years. Right, Tristan? He says, I don't know. I'm a little guy. So... Cranial work can be really, really helpful. Uh, for end of life issues. Yeah, your dog eats better than you. Most people's dogs do eat better than they do. If you are very aware as a pet owner. <laughs> and it's hard, you know, people are vegans and vegetarians and gluten intolerant. And, you know, it's hard to not let our dietary issues spill over into our dog's lives. But we really need to feed them what they need. Um, and it really makes a huge difference in their lifespan and their health and um, all of that. So that's a little bit off topic today, but certainly information that people need to know. So this week we're at our educator job Monday and Wednesday. So we should be back on Tuesday, barring further household situations. They're coming to cut down some trees and I don't know when. <laughs> if that happens, it'll be so loud. <laughs> Right, Bisky? He says, oh, I have to take care of all that. No kibble. No Walmart supermarket kibble. Yeah, that's the truth. Oh, there was a time, though, when that was all we had. You know, wellness was a really great food. And, of course, the company got sold and sold, and they changed the mix and... It's very difficult to stay on top of what's happening with different pet foods. Oh, great, Angel. All right, you guys, I'll see you on Tuesday. Everybody have a great day. Um, to those in the south, stay warm. The snow does go away. I have lots of experience with snow living up here. And thankfully, we have none. And poor North Carolina and all through West Virginia, they have got tons of snow right now. So we'll see you guys in a couple days. Have a good time outside today. Bye-bye. <laughs>